Welcome to Reading the Bible with Pastor. Today we're on Mark chapter 6. Jesus has been telling us who he is and telling the people around him who he is as well. He's been teaching and teaching that he's the Lord of the Sabbath and he's also been doing miracles including calming a storm and healing people and raising a little girl from the dead, Jairus' daughter. It points to when Jesus will come back again and he will raise us all from the dead and take to him the faithful, those that, that believe that he is their savior, to heaven, to paradise. Jesus is continuing to reveal that he is not just a man, but he is God as well. He is God and man, and he is going to be the sacrifice for us, for our salvation. He's going to go back to his hometown, Nazareth, and Nazareth is where he grew up, he became a man. He was actually born in Bethlehem, and that is the hometown of his father, Joseph. Joseph actually descends from the people, from David, and King David, and Bethlehem is the hometown of David. So that's where we get Jesus born in Bethlehem, but his hometown where he was raised is in Nazareth, there on the northeast side of Galilee. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. So, just like everybody else, they are getting to hear him teach, and he is teaching true word to them, but they have a different reaction. And they were saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. We can see this in the world uh, as well, that great people do, do some great things. They, they're sports stars, or singers, or celebrities. Uh, but when they come back home, their family just says, Oh, he's just a brother, he's just a sister, a father, or a mother. They don't actually see them as this great person. They see them as just the regular folk. Jesus is not just regular folk. Yes, he grew up there. He became a carpenter, but he is the son of God. And he is teaching them that he is. But they still can't get past the earthly in him, his humanity. They only can see that this is the kid that was born, that we got to see grow older into a teenager and into an adult. They cannot come to that faith just yet that he is their salvation. He is their God. So they take offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there except that he lay his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So this is not a state of they're angry with him because he's so great, but a state of unbelief. How can he be this guy? We, we know who he is. Well, no, they don't know who he is, even though they've seen him for the past 30 years or so. They will only know when Christ reveals it, when the Spirit reveals that he is the Son of God. And so Jesus must send out others to tell who he is. And so he's going to do that here with the disciples. And Jesus went out among the villages, teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, Shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that the people should repent. So Jesus understands and knows that in the future he's going to send the apostles, the sent ones, out into the world to proclaim who he is and what he has done, that he is our salvation. So here we get a little glimpse of Jesus sending out the twelve. Now, this isn't a moment that we see that the, the twelve are extra special. What is extra special, what is the miraculous thing, is that the Holy Spirit works through these 12 men to bring faith to the people. Jesus could not break into the people's minds and to their hearts in his own hometown because all they could see was 
this boy that grew up, this Jesus before them, the man, the apostles, the disciples here, the sent ones, are able to actually proclaim that truth amongst other people. It's a reminder that in our lives, one pastor or one person may teach the same thing, but that teaching might affect a person differently. They may realize and come to understand who Jesus is and what he really has done. So we should be understanding that the church as in a whole, as a whole is sent out to the world to everybody to proclaim that truth. And it takes a different word from different people to reach people and bring them to faith. The Holy Spirit is doing that work. And we don't know why or how, but it is the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit in the disciples as they are sent out that they are able to do such great things. And here are the great things that they do. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. It is not because they are some great people. It is because the inward working of the Holy Spirit in them. What we see in Jesus is they don't see him as great. They see him as just a man. And he is not able to do great things because they won't take that in faith. So we see men being able to do great things because of the Holy Spirit. And we see Jesus, God himself, not able to do great things because people will not have faith in him. We continue here with the death of John the Baptist, the end of his ministry. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had been become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work within him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Okay, so we, we kind of jump forward in time, and then we're going to kind of come back to see what actually happened. King Herod here is hearing of all these great things, and he knows of John the Baptist and what he's done, for he has imprisoned him. And not only that, he has actually beheaded him. And he wonders if John the Baptist has come back from the dead to do these great things, heal people. So let's see what happens. For it was Herod who had, been, who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. So King Herod sees John as somebody who is doing great things, and he doesn't know what to do with him just yet. Herod does, I mean, excuse me, John does proclaim a, a message of repentance. Uh, repent of your sins so that Jesus may, may come to you and provide for you the good news, the gospel, the forgiveness of sins. Herod has married his brother's wife, which is unlawful according to the, to the Old Testament law. And he shouldn't have done that. And John is telling him, repent. Repent and be forgiven. But he doesn't. And Herodias, his wife, takes offense at that. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to, to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask, I will give it to you, up to half my kingdom." Now, the idea here is that the king is supposed to look like he's very generous, up to half his kingdom. It is hyperbole. It is meant to show that he's able to give as much as he wants because she, somebody's done a great thing here, his daughter. But the person is supposed to understand and be respectful that he's not going to give him, them half the kingdom. But they may ask for a hard thing. And his daughter went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. Basically, he was put in a hard spot. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. 
He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. John the Baptist is the last prophet, and he dies a prophet's death uh, at the hands of his enemies. We're actually going to see how the people will treat Jesus, who is the last person to really reveal all things about the Lord, about God, and who he is and his salvation. And we'll see what happens here at the end of Mark. Just keep that in mind of that prophets die at the hands of their enemies. We'll pick up here next time with continuing to see what Jesus does with verse 30.